Now I know you've heard how epic dad jokes are. I'm a dad, but I also have a dad. My dad told me this one, so you know it's a good dad joke. What did the old chimney say to the young chimney? Stop smoking. It's decent, right? No? 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 Boop! <gasps> I wore a suit for you today. You should feel special. I put this thing on just to record. So, I'm going for the men in black look, but I didn't have black, so it's gray. Men in gray. Um, what are we doing today? Well, today we're going to be analyzing incidents that provoke decisions and reveal character. Provoke decisions. Provoke means to make something happen. It's almost like you irritate something. Like um, you provoke your little brother to hit you when you constantly steal his Hot Wheels and throw them out the window. You'll provoke him to anger. So um, we're going to be looking at decisions that are made in the book and how those decisions provoke um, actions by other characters and what that reveals about our characters. Buckle up. By the way, you like those transitions? It's pretty cool. I should put some sound effects in, but I think you'd get a little annoyed with me going every time I go to a new slide. So let's look at this. What we did last time is we gathered relevant textual evidence. The, the, mainly that's what we did. We identified evidence to support a claim or a thesis statement. We also said this is a thesis. Thesis? I feel like I'm getting a little better. Um, about Buck's transformation in the wild, being dependent on his changing relationship with man. And you might say his changing relationship with man. Yes, this is basically how is his relationship with Francois and Perrault changing? And how did his relationship with his original master, you know, it changed from his original master in California to uh, being different with Perrault and Francois. And now even Perrault and Francois, he's starting to back off a little bit from them. He's starting to be a little more independent and sneaky. So Buck's relationship's changing. Hey, we will begin reading chapter four, Call of the Wild. It's going to be pages 41 to 45 in this version of the book. If you don't have this version, that's fine. I will still let you know where we're at by telling you like the beginning of the paragraph, like the, what the words are at the beginning of the paragraph. Uh, we're going to analyze how incidents in the text provoke characters to make decisions. Okay, incidents, so things happen that make people make decisions and reveal insight into Buck's character. I know that sounds kind of confusing right now, but you'll see it when we get there. You'll go, oh, that thing happened and it made someone make a decision and it tells us something about Buck. Um, and I will say, there's an unexpected moment in our reading today. Make me a little sad, a little bit sad. I hope you're okay though. But to make me happy, I've added, that's right, the bonus. All right, so we do have a bonus during today's lesson. Make sure you watch it all the way through. If I'm reading too slow for you, I'm going too slow, you can make the video go faster, play it at one and a half times speed or two times speed if you're really brave. Um, I don't sound like a chipmunk, but, um, but it does go faster, so you don't have to listen to me as much. All right, be looking for that bonus. What you're going to need today, Call of the Wild by Jack London. Oh, and you can't see it down here. This says Call of the Wild. And my face is covering it. I'll have to move my face. Um, but yes, you need Call of the Wild by Jack London. Vocabulary chart. An incident chart on Blue Notebook, page 37. This is Blue Notebook, page 37. And you're going to need notebook paper. This is a separate sheet of paper. If you want to use your Ace, Ice, Ick, piece of paper, I can give you one of those, or you can just write it on a blank sheet of paper. All right, so we're going to start reading chapter four. Very cool chapter. Very cool. We, we've been seeing this tension between Buck and Spitz for a long time. We've been seeing how um, this tension has made the team basically useless. 
They can't get anywhere on time. They can't get anything done. Perot and Francois are just getting irritated and annoyed at everything because Buck is constantly making everyone turn against Spitz. So Spitz and Buck have their final standoff. Buck comes out victorious. And now we get to see what Buck is like without Spitz around. I'm excited. Get ready. Get your book open. Beginning of chapter four, page 41, again in this copy of the book, page 41 in that copy, or just whatever your copy you're reading is, uh, page, it's uh, the beginning of chapter four. Go ahead and pause the video and get to page 41. Okay, you're there. And you'll see here that we're going to begin uh, chapter four. And we're going to end on page 42. We have three separate readings today, okay? So don't think this is it. Uh, we're going to end at page 42 with the last words of the paragraph being wise in the ways of clubs. Mm, the club comes back. I wonder what happens. Let's find out. Follow along with me. Chapter 4. Who has won mastership? Good question. Eh, hey, what I say? I speak true when I say dat buck two devils. This was Francois' speech next morning when he discovered Spitz missing and Buck covered with wounds. He drew him to the fire and by its light pointed them out. Dat Spitz fight like hell, said Perrault as he surveyed the gaping rips and cuts. And dat buck fight like two hells, was Francois' answer. And now... We make good time. No more spits, no more trouble. Sure. While Perrault packed the campfire, uh, packed the camp outfit, and loaded the sled, the dog driver proceeded to harness the dogs. Buck trotted up to the place Spitz would have occupied as the leader. But Francois, not noticing him, brought Solex to the coveted position. Pause. Coveted means something everybody wants. Something everybody wants. The new iPhone is the coveted phone. So what's this coveted position? It's the, yeah, it's the lead position. Okay. All the dogs want to be the leader. So, um, and who is, who is Francois picking as the leader? Solex. Okay. And honestly, that's probably a good decision because Solex has been around a long time he knows what's up. He's in the number two position. Buck hasn't been around that long. Yeah, he's strong and he's he's intelligent, but he hasn't been around very long. So making making Buck the leader might not be a great idea. Um, so Francois is making a safe choice here. Let's go back to the book, very bottom. Uh, Francois, not noticing him, brought Solex to the coveted position. In his judgment, Solex was the best lead dog left. Buck sprang upon Solex in a fury, driving him back and standing in his place. <laughs> Poor Solex. He's blind. He's half blind. He's missing an eye. And Buck's just jumping on him like, Rah! it's not his fault. Buck, chill out. It reminds us of Spitz a little bit. It's interesting. Interesting. Hey, hey. Francois cried, slapping his thighs gleefully. <laughs> Look at that buck! Him kill that spitz! Him take to take the job! Go away! Shoot! He cried, but Buck refused to budge. He took Buck by the scruff of the neck and threw uh, the dog. Oh, sorry, and though the dog growled threateningly, dragged him to one side and replaced Solex. The dog did not like it and showed plainly that he was afraid of Buck. Francois was obdurate. We're going to talk about that word obdurate, so don't freak out yet. But when he turned his back, Buck again displaced Solex, who was not at all willing to go. Francois was angry. Now by gar I fix you he cried, coming back with a heavy club in his hand. So what's going on here? Buck is doing what? Yeah, Buck keeps shoving Solex out of the way so he can be the leader. 
Buck wants to be the leader. And Francois like, nope, nope. You might have beaten Spitz, but we just got you two weeks ago. You don't know enough. You know, so – and they're fighting back and forth. So Francois goes to get the club. Next paragraph. Buck remembered the man in the red sweater and retreated slowly. Nor did he attempt to charge in when Solex was once more brought forward. He circled just beyond the range of the club, snarling and bitterness and rage. And while he circled, he watched the club so as to dodge it if thrown by Francois, for he was becoming wise in the way of clubs. The driver went about his work. This is um, Francois, the driver. And he called Buck when he was ready to put him in his old place in front of Dave. Buck retreated two or three steps. Francois followed him, whereupon he again retreated. After some time of this, Francois threw down the club, thinking that Buck feared a thrashing. Buck was in open revolt. That means he was just defying. He's just like, nope, I'm not doing it. He wanted not to escape a clubbing, but to have leadership. It was his by right. He had earned it, and he would not be content with less. I read too far, and that's just fine, because y'all are amazing. I read a paragraph extra because I'm excited, so that's okay. We'll pick it up on that paragraph on the next one. Let's move on to the next slide. So we're going to look at a vocabulary word here. It's the word obdurate, obdurate, or obdurate, right here. Ooh, Francois was obdurate. Hmm. I wonder what that means. So if I look at this word ob, and then I also have, or it's not a word. Ob is not a word, but a prefix. Dur, dur. Dur, dur. What, what, what's, what's dur related to? Maybe durable? Do you guys know what durable means? You know, a lot of times they advertise uh, tools that are durable. Long-lasting, okay? Very, very hard, okay? Very hard. Like a rock is very durable. A rock will not be destroyed. So if Francois is obdurate and ob, this ob, this is related to a word like obstinate, um, obstinate, um, obsidian. If you've ever heard of the rock called obsidian, it's a black, uh, volcanic rock that looks very glassy. It looks like black glass. Oh, obsidian. Okay. Minecraft, right? Obsidian, right? You mine obsidian and it's like really hard. Okay. You got this. So ob, something very hard, dur, something that can't be broken and durable. So when it says Francois was obdurate, but when he turned his back, Buck again displaced Solex. What do you think obdurate means in that context? It doesn't mean Francois was rocky. What does this mean, though? Something related to rocks and stones and hardness and what do you think? Go ahead and look it up. And go ahead and put this in your vocabulary chart. Push pause on the video. Go do that. Make sure you get a little sentence or a picture. Pause the video now. Okay, here we go. Um, we're going to read back that last paragraph that I read extra, but it's there on page 42. Follow along with me. The driver. Here we go. The driver went about his work, and he called uh, to Buck when he was ready to put him in his old place in front of Dave. Buck retreated two or three steps. Francois followed him up. Whereupon, he again retreated. After some time of this, Francois threw down the club, thinking that Buck feared a thrashing. But Buck was in open revolt. He wanted not to escape a clubbing, but to have the leadership. It was his by right. He had earned it, and he would not be content with less. Perrault took a hand. Between them, they ran him about for the better part of an hour hour. They threw clubs at him. He dodged. They cursed him 
and his fathers and mothers before him and all his seed to come after him down to the remotest generation and every hair on his body and drop of blood in his veins. Okay, these guys are on a cur You can imagine what it sounded like in that camp. <laughs> They're running around for an hour screaming curses at this dog. They've run out of things to curse him for. They've cursed every single part of his body down to every single hair, all of his blood in, in his veins, his family, his mom's mom, and his future generation. They're just going crazy. They are really mad at Buck because he's not listening. What do you think? What do you think Buck's doing? You think Buck's going to be a good leader or a bad leader? What's up with this? Let's find out. I'm curious. Very, very bottom of 42. And he answered curse with snarl and kept out of their reach. He did not try to run away, but retreated around and around the camp, advertising plainly that when his desire was met, he would come in and be good. Francois sat down and scratched his head. By the way, this moment where he, he says, um, when his desire was met, he would come in and be good. This reminds me of the part where he was getting shoes from uh, Francois. Francois was cutting up his own shoes to make little boots for, <laughs> for Buck because his feet were so soft. And Buck would roll over on his back. He wouldn't run in the morning. He'd just roll out, out, over on his back and hold his feet up in the air. I think it's something we see in Buck. The Buck's a little spoiled brat. He, he's a spoiled brat. And he likes to be spoiled. You know, I think that's consistent with his character. He started off as like a very preppy. You could think of him as the preppy kid, rich kid. Uh, you know, he lived in a big house and a mansion. And so he's very spoiled there. And we see now... Even still, he's spoiled, but he's very strong as well. It's an interesting character. Let's pick up that um, paragraph again uh, at the top of page 43, the first paragraph, Francois. Francois sat down and scratched his head. Perrault looked at his watch and swore. Time was flying, and they should have been on the trail an hour ago. Francois swat, scratched his head again. He shook it and grinned sheepishly at the courier, who shrugged his shoulders in sign that they were beaten. Then Francois went up to where Solek stood and called to Buck. Buck laughed as dogs laugh, yet kept his distance. Francois unfastened Solek's traces and put him back in his old place. The team stood harnessed to the sled in an unbroken line ready for the trail. There was no place for Buck, save at the front. Once more Francois called, and once more Buck laughed and kept away. Draw down to club, Perrault commanded. Francois complied, whereupon Buck trotted in, laughing triumphantly, and swung around into position at the head of the team. His traces were fastened, the sled broken out, and with both men running, they dashed out onto the river trail. Pause there. I look. This is interesting. Buck is assertive. He is assertive, which means he he gets his way. Um, he makes sure he gets his way too. All right. So here we are. With a partner, I'd like you to discuss some things uh, for a moment. Look at these questions, and I want you to go ahead and discuss these with someone around you. Uh, first of all, what actions does Buck take in response to Francois? Okay, Francois is trying to put Solex in the lead. What is Buck's response to that? And why is he responding that way? Hmm? Next. How do Buck's actions provoke Francois and Perrault to respond? So what's their reaction to Buck here? Like, what's their ultimate reaction? Yes, they get mad and they curse for a long time, but ultimately and finally, what's their final response to him? Okay, what does that tell us about Buck? What does that tell us about Buck? That these really 
hard men who are like really strong and really intense wild men, what does it tell us about Buck that he gets his way? Interesting. Okay, I want you to go ahead and pause the video here, discuss these, take, uh, take two or three minutes and just discuss your thoughts on this. Um, debate with someone around you, see if you can figure it out. Uh, again, take about three minutes, pause the video now. All right, so you are done with your conversation. If you're not, pause the video and do it. But if you are done, then go ahead and turn in your blue notebook to page 37. It's this little guy right here, page 37. Pause if you need to get there. All right, so you are there, page 37, and you'll see incident summary on the left and observations and inferences on the right. I'd like you to fill in just this one top one. Oops, I'm sorry. Hit the mic. Uh, this top, just this top um, row, okay? One, one incident. Um, Buck getting the lead spot, okay? Summarize, basic summary of what happened. Do that. And then what does this tell us about Buck? So basically everything you just discussed here, all of this, this is like, where is it? Okay, what actually is Buck? Okay, so look, this is like summary, right here, the summary of what happens, it goes right here. Woo! And then your interpretation, what does this tell us about the character of Buck? That goes right here. See, no wasted time. Go ahead and fill that in, then you move on to the next slide. Pause it here. Okay, welcome back. We're gonna continue in chapter four and some unexpected things happen. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't expecting this when I started reading this chapter. All right, so we're on page 43. And um, as we read this section, I want you to be thinking about another incident that you'll pick out of your choice. Okay, there are a couple of things that happen here. But, uh, but I would like you to pick your own and you'll fill in another incident on your incident chart. So just so I can, I'll draw it here so you can see. So we already filled in this one. Yes, we did that one. And yes, we did that one. So we'll go for number two here. So while we're reading, just be thinking about that. All right, so page 43, we're gonna start with highly as the dog and we're gonna end on page 45 at the end of the paragraph, which says Buck's life for good. Ooh. Buck's life for good. Okay, let's see what happens. Highly as the dog driver had four valued Buck with his two devils he found while the day was yet young that he had undervalued. Push pause. Awkward sentence. I don't know if you guys know this, but Jack London, he learned to write by copying British authors, hand copying. He would, you know how sometimes I give copy work, I'm like, y'all, we're bad. You need to copy paragraphs. And you're like, why do we got to do this, Mr. Fairber? And I'm like, because this is actually how writers learn to write sometimes. And you're like, no, it isn't. Well, yes, actually it is. Jack London taught himself to write by hand copying novels of British authors. British authors have a really awkward way of writing sometimes that doesn't make a lot of sense to Americans. This sentence is one of them. Let's try it one more time and let's see if you can figure out what this sentence is saying. Let's start over. <clears throat> Oof, it's very British though. Highly as the dog driver had four valued buck with his two devils, he found while the day was yet young that he had undervalued. Let me translate this. It's saying that Perot was like, dang, Buck is two devils worth of a dog, meaning Buck's intense. And it says by the end of the day, they strapped him into the leadership role, and by the end of the day, he found out that two devils, that wasn't even enough. He's way more intense than that. He's like, two devils, that's not enough. I undervalued him. So let's read about it. At a bound or at a jump, Buck took up the duties of leadership and where judgment was required and quick thinking, quick acting, 
he showed himself the superior even to Spitz, of whom Francois had never seen an equal. So Francois had never seen a dog better than Spitz. And Buck is blowing it out of the water. Buck is making Spitz look like a total moron, okay? So let's go next one. But it was in giving the law and making his mates live up to it that Buck excelled. Dave and Solex did not mind the change in leadership. It was none of their business. Their business was toil and toil mightily. That means work and work hard in the traces. So long as they were not interfered with, they did not care what happened. Billy, the good-natured, could lead for all they cared so long as he kept order. The rest of the team, however, had grown unruly during the last days of Spitz, and their surprise was great now that Buck proceeded to lick them into shape. Pike, who pulled at Buck's heels, and who never... Pike's the malingerer, by the way, the faker... Pike, who pulled at Buck's heels and who never put an ounce more of his weight against the breastband than he was compelled to do. That means he's kind of lazy at his job. He was swiftly and repeatedly shaken for loafing. That means taking it easy. And ere the first day uh, was done, he was pulling more than ever before in his life. The first night in camp, Joe, the sour one, was punished roundly a thing that Spitz had never succeeded in doing. Buck simply smothered him by virtue of superior weight. He basically just sat on him until he couldn't breathe anymore and cut him up till he ceased snapping and began to whine for mercy. <laughs> I know you've seen dogs do that. The general tone of the team picked up immediately. It recovered its old solidarity. Solidarity. Solid means altogether. Togetherness. It's solid. It's not liquid. It's not gas. It's solid. Altogether. The team recovered its solidarity, and once more the dogs leaped as one dog in the traces. At the rink rapids, two native huskies, Teak and Kuna, were added, and the celerity or speed with which Buck broke them in took away Francois's breath. Ne'er is such a dog as dat buck, he cried. No, nary. Him worth a thousand dollars, by gar, eh? What do you say, Perrault? And Perrault nodded. He was ahead of the record then, and gaining day by day. The trail was in excellent condition, well packed and hard, and there was no new fallen snow with which to contend. It was not too cold. The temperature dropped to 50 below zero and remained there the whole trip. The men rode and ran by turn, and the dogs were kept on the jump, but in frequent stoppages, with infrequent stoppages. The 30 mile river was comparatively coated with ice, and they covered it in one day, going out what had taken them 10 days coming in. Hold up, Buck got them through in one day what it took them 10 days to cover with spits. Like, that's amazing. And it's not just because he's fast. I mean, the trail is better, um, everything, is, everything is better. Like, all the conditions are better. But still, you know, Buck is, Buck is the one making it happen. It's the very top of the page. In one run, they made a 60-mile dash from the foot of Lake Labarge to the White Horse Rapids across Marsh, Tagish, and Bennett, 70 miles of lakes. They flew so fast that the man whose turn it was to run towed behind the sled at the end of a rope. And on the last night of the second week, they topped White Pass and dropped down the sea slope with the lights of Skagway and the shipping at their feet. It was a record run. So push pause. They just arrived at like a town, okay, called Skagway. So they're at a town called Skagway, and the culture in these towns is like the sled dogs are the only way to get around from town to town, and it takes days and days of travel. So everyone in these towns has these sled dogs, 
and it's a bunch of men, so they're super competitive, and they're all trying to break the record of who can go fastest between the towns. And Francois, Perrault, Buck just killed the record. They just killed the record when they arrive in Skagway, okay? So let's see what happens. I'll uh, start again in that paragraph. It was a record run. Each day, for 14 days, they had averaged 40 miles. For three days, Perrault and Francois threw chests up and down the main street of Skagway and were deluged with invitations to drink. That means like they were walking with their chests thrown up. It means they were like, ha, 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 look, we got here. Ha, 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 we broke the record. And then everyone in the town is just like, hey, let me get you a drink. Come on in here. Let me treat you guys. You're famous. Good job. So, you know, they're loving it, Perrault and Francois. And really all they did is they let Buck kill Spitz. I mean, <laughs> and then Buck decided to be the leader. Uh, pretty interesting. This is really Buck's victory. So let's continue uh, with invitations to drink. While the team, that's the team of dogs, was the constant center of a worshipful crowd of dog busters and mushers. Everyone loves it. They're like, whoa, look at those dogs. Look at Buck. Oh my goodness, look at this. Three, then... Three or four Western bad men aspired to clean out the town. They wanted to rob the town. There's some guys that showed up and wanted to rob the town. They were riddled like timber boxes for their pains. And public interest turned to other idols. He's saying some guys from the West showed up to try to rob the town, but some people shot them all up. It says riddled them like – it means put holes in them. Put holes in them like um, boxes. Wooden box. It's, it's a weird phrase, but basically it just shot them up. They shot up these guys, and then the public interest turned to other idols as saying, basically the dogs were really famous until these guys tried to rob the town, got shot up, and now the guys who shot up these guys are the heroes, so nobody cares about the dogs anymore. <laughs> it's like, they moved on. Next came official orders. Francois called Buck to him, threw his arms around him, and wept over him. And that was the last of Francois and Perrault. Like other men, they passed out of Buck's life for good. Wait, what? So after all the fame, all the fortune, next came official orders. Hmm. So somebody bought Buck. Pretty amazing. How do you guys feel about that? Francois Perrault, done. Their part in the story is over. They were pretty important to Buck. They were pretty important. What do you think? Do you think Francois and Perrault were important, or do you think they just kind of, Buck would have developed into an amazing sled dog anyway? What's your thought? I want to know what your opinion is. In fact, as a bonus, very secret bonus, I'm not leaving it up long. Um, I do want to know what your thought is on this. The very top of page 37, right here, I want you to put a little star. Put a little star right here. And I want you to write, do you, uh, I want you to write your quick opinion, just one sentence. Do you think Francois and Perrault were necessary for Buck to become amazing? Or do you think Buck had greatness in him all along? What are your thoughts? Fill it in as a bonus, and I'll give you a Bears ticket signature. I think I owe you guys some other ones, uh, so I'm going to get you those. All right? Good job. Okay. The last thing we're going to do is you need a blank sheet of paper, your own sheet of paper that you're going to put inside of this booklet here. Um, how do Buck's actions throughout Chapter 4 provoke decisions and reveal new insights into his character. <clears throat> now, I realize that on the last slide, I forgot to just remind you, but I'm going to do it now. You do need uh whoop, you do need this done right here and this done. Pick any other event from chapter 4 to fill in here and then maybe you did the bonus up here as well. Okay, so you've got those. You've got those, they're done. Good. All right, now let's look at this. Uh, this is going to be an asysic paragraph because it's 
it's a paragraph, write a paragraph. That includes a claim, logical reasoning, relevant evidence. Hmm. So great, this is ace I sick. You got that ace I sick. I don't have to write the whole thing out. You know what I'm saying. Brrr, right there. All right, ace I sick. How do Buck's actions throughout chapter four provoke decisions and reveal new insights into his character? How do they reveal new insights into his character? I'm going to let you think about that, brainstorm on that, and answer that question. Pause the video. Come back when you're done. You did so good. You did so good. I hope you're feeling these ace paragraphs are getting easier and easier. That's my goal is you're going to rock these things. Okay, so in this lesson, you started reading and discussing Chapter 4, Call of the Wild. You also analyzed how incidents in the chapter provided key decisions and revealed insights into Buck's character. I'm excited to find out what's Buck going to do under someone else's leadership. Is, is the person that Buck is going to be working for, are they going to understand what a genius Buck is, or are they going to take him for granted? I'm not too sure. We're going to find out together. I'm looking forward to it, and I will see you in the next lesson. Peace.